Nicole Lamana. Uh, she is uh, a, a, an expert in CLL and related uh, lymphoid malignancies and leukemias uh, and is coming to us uh, today from uh, Columbia University Medical Center uh, in New York where she's an associate professor and a clinical investigator there. Uh, she also has made uh, very important contributions, uh, in particular uh, to the development of clinical trials, uh, evaluating novel agents across the spectrum of the lymphoid malignancies I've mentioned, and, and, and with a particular uh, interest and focus on chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Um, she is going to uh, talk to us today about how and when to treat. Uh, it really is a, a pleasure to have her here with us, and uh, uh, please give her a, well, a warm welcome. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, for those of you who, who may know anything about me, um, I, I recently uh, moved from Memorial Sloan Kettering after 12 years being there as a, a CLL specialist to Columbia University, where we decided to grow the leukemia service there. They really didn't have one. And so the Cancer Center at Columbia offered a, a, a fantastic opportunity for myself and uh, five of my colleagues on the leukemia service to move. So I'm recently at Columbia the last two years. Uh, so it's been quite, uh, uh, quite a change. Some of you met me. I see some of my uh, patients and some of you have uh, seen me either at Memorial or at Columbia. So I didn't think you guys would come all the way up here. <laughs> so it's quite nice to see familiar faces. Um, because I know it, on your program it says when and how to treat is what I'm supposed to review. Uh, and, and clearly the excellent speakers yesterday between uh, Michael Keating and Michael Halleck and everybody else, they kind of covered some of this. So I'm going to go back to really go into patient stuff, what you need to know about treatments, when you're getting treated, how to diagnose, CAT scan, somebody mentioned the dental We'll br I'll bring up all of those issues that are, you know, more maybe uh, more potent and basic for all of you. Again, some of you uh, might have been through a lot of this, so it might be a little bit mundane. But for some of you, this might be relatively new. And so I think that going back to the basics is quite okay. And repetition is always good. Uh, so here we're going to start. All right. We, as you know, that people already discussed that CLL is the most common leukemia, but let's put let's put leukemia in perspective to solid tumor cancers. Okay. So leukemias in general really represent the minority of cancers. We're the underdogs. Okay. So if you put all the leukemias together, all the blood cancers together, we really only represent four to five percent of the total incidence of cancer. So when we talk about specialists. You can understand, because if you have complications of your disease or issues, or you talk about, well, I may have this autoimmune problem, or talk about, um, did you notice when I get a bug bite, it's really exaggerated? Why is that? Do other doctors know this? So this is where we talk about the fact that leukemia is uncommon. So even though CLL is the most common, it's still relatively uncommon, okay? But because the median survival of CLL compared to other cancers is relatively long, and thankfully, as you've seen yesterday with all that wonderful data, clearly the survival of CLL patients is getting longer, we're going to be faced with other issues. Um, and so, there, you know, the prevalence uh, of, of CLL patients, there's many more individuals living with CLL at any given time, even though the incidence is only about 15,000 new cases a year. Now, the median age of diagnosis is 72. I know many of you might be younger than that in the audience. Um, but just so you know that when we looked at traditional chemoimmunotherapy programs, you know, we really, really cheated the average age of patients with this disease because the average age is somebody in their 70s, okay? And the median time to most people's first treatment is three to four years after diagnosis. So you're talking late 70s. So a lot of the chemoimmunotherapy regimens that we've touted, like FCR and bendamustine and rituximab, were really possibly too aggressive for somebody who might be 80 and getting their first treatment. So most clinical trials that I'm, Michael Keating, Michael Halleck, myself, have run, you know, decades ago, um, like on, so, on FCR, we ran a sequential FCR memorial program that I reported many years ago, really were on patients who were 10 to 15 years younger than the average age of patients with CLL. So you have to keep that in mind when we talk about chemoimmunotherapy programs going forward. It's really, really important. Finally, in the last five to seven years, we finally dedicated clinical trials to patients with the average age of this disease. So kudos, kudos to the investigators and to some of the pharmaceutical companies to allow us to do that. So what is CLL? Okay, now obviously we belabored and, and Susan did a great 
I have to say, I, I loved her talk going back about genetics. Um, so I uh, will touch a little bit about that. But it's really a disorder of one of your blood cells, you know, in particular the B lymphocyte. And these, think of, remember, when you compare this again to solid tumors, you have to think of this as a systemic illness. It's the, your blood circulates all over, it's all over. So when people talk about this, they go, well, if I have breast cancer and it spreads to my bone, that's metastatic disease. You have to think of your CLLs all over. It's in your blood. Your blood goes through your organs. The lymphocytes can aggregate in the lymphatic system. That's the lymph nodes. Think of your spleen as a big lymph node. So you have to think of it. If I'm going to biopsy your toe and you have a white count of 200, I'm going to see CLL. So I need you to think of this disease very differently than you might think of lung or breast or colon cancer. Okay? Now, when we talk about SLL, because people often, when they get diagnosed or they read their pathology reports, particularly if you've had a lymph node biopsy, people often will say, well, the report might say, I have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or I have small lymphocytic lymphoma. What does that mean? It's really, when you look under the microscope, the cells are the same as CLL cells. Okay, they mark, they have the same um, markers on the outside of the lymphocytes, um, whether they're in the blood or in the lymph node. So don't get confused, because the nomenclature is the same. I do argue with my lymphoma colleagues, for those of you out there, about the difference between le leukemia and lymphoma. Okay, so if you have true SLL, you really just have lymph node-based disease. You really don't have bone marrow involvement, okay? Now, I do think the two different populations sometimes handle chemoimmunotherapy programs differently. Okay, but that's a different argument, okay? I think, I think people who have bone marrow issues sometimes have more toxicities than the true SLL patients but we've never reported that in the literature, now have we? Okay. Um, what are the causes of CLL? We really don't know. You know, unlike some leukemias and some cancers, predisposition people talked about yesterday to whether you've had chemotherapy for breast cancer or colon cancer, if you've had radiation treatment, think about Chernobyl, the incidence of acute leukemia and thyroid cancer went, out, went up dramatically. So we do know some, you know, there are some insight inciting agents or environmental causes that could contribute. You know, think about what Susan talked about with your genes and your DNA, that sometimes, you know, our body is really good. As Susan said, you know, our body repairs itself all the time. So we, a lot of us have mutations and, and abnormalities going on, but our body is sophisticated enough to actually repair those abnormalities. But sometimes you might have something that's inherent you might have an abnormality, and then you take another hit from something else like the environment or some other exposure, radiation treatment or chemotherapy treatment, and it tends to push yourself, your DNA, to the next level. And hence, you may develop leukemia or some other cancer. So we don't know all the particular causes of different cancers, um, but certainly we're learning about them as they evolve. Diagnosis. Now, many of you, have, we talked about all these sophisticated tests. Now, years ago, we used to routinely do bone marrow evaluations on everybody who got diagnosed with leukemia because we weren't sophisticated enough to look. We didn't have those tests off your peripheral blood um, as sophisticated. We'd look at morphology, and that came from the bone marrow. Okay, So think about your bone marrow as where you originate, where you make your good cells, but where you make these leukemia cells. Okay. Now our testing has gotten so sophisticated that if you present with, you know, most people with CLL present incidentally. So if you have an elevated white count, you're often told to come back to your physician's office because maybe you have a cold or something, you're not feeling well, and they just go, we'll just see if that's really true. Um, and then oftentimes then you're sent to a hematologist or oncologist and you have those blood tests, the, the flow cytometry. So those look at the markers on those CLL cells or on any of your cells, looking at uh, if they express certain features that are akin to one leukemia versus another leukemia versus another lymphoma. So you express certain markers that are characteristic of your cancer, okay? Um, another possible, most common way people get diagnosed is that they're picked up because they notice a lymph node. They might have had it for a really long time. They finally go to the doctor and say, what is this? You know, I've had it for a while. Or women, classic example of how women get diagnosed, they get their mammogram. They note a lymph node on your mammogram. That's the most classic presentation sometimes we see in women who get diagnosed with CLL. What are the signs or symptoms that you may experience? Most people at diagnosis with CLL are asymptomatic, okay? Again, picked up routinely, either because you find something on your physical exam or you have some routine blood work, whether it be for pre-op testing for some other surgery or something, or you go to your internist and again, they notice that your white count is elevated. So most people don't have symptoms when they first present, unlike other leukemias. Very, very different, okay? But let's talk about your blood counts. Let's go through them so you understand what they mean when you see your CBC. 
Okay? So obviously the hallmark of this disease is that your white count might be elevated or you might have big bulky lymph nodes. Okay? But if your red cell count is low, so think of the red cells as um, the gas in the car of your tank. So if you don't have enough red cells, and there's many reasons why you could be anemic, okay? So if you have, um, if you're a menstruating woman, you can, you can be anemic at that time of the month. If you have bad gastritis, you can be anemic because of that reason, because you're shedding some red cells through your GI tract. What we're really talking about in this case is being anemic because your bone marrow is infiltrated from your leukemia cells. So it's suppressing your red cell count from going out into your system. Okay, so think about it. If your red cells low, you have, don't have as much gas. When you're climbing those flight of stairs, you're huffing and puffing. You know, it's now you may be huffing and puffing for lots of other reasons, or you may be tired for lots of other reasons. But when you're really truly anemic, you're going to feel it. Okay, it's not something that's intermittent. It'll be slowly progressive. You'll have a harder time with what you're doing. You'll notice it. Now, what about if your platelets are low? So the platelets are what help clotting. So if you cut yourself. You, the platelets help by stopping you from bleeding. So people who have very low platelets can be prone to bleeding. If you can bruise easily, okay. Um, some people bruise easily normally. Okay, that might be a platelet dysfunction, not because the number is low. So, so don't don't I don't want you to confuse that. But clearly, that's something we want to prevent. So if somebody's platelets are very low, we know they might be at more risk for bleeding, and we want that, to, and we don't want that to happen. Okay, now what about your neutrophils? We talk about this a lot, particularly for people who are on chemo immunotherapy programs. So when the neutrophils are low, you're more prone to infections. Most typically bacterial infections, okay? There are some other atypical infections people can get with CLL, but most, most, most common bacterial, bacterial, bacterial. So when the neutrophils are low, you'll oftentimes hear your doctor go, like you to know, avoid crowns or, you know, let's be very careful. If people are sick, they shouldn't be around you, that kind of thing until your neutrophils recover. So that's what they're referring to, okay? Now what about big bulky lymph nodes? So having lymph nodes alone doesn't mean you necessarily need treatment. Just like having a high white count doesn't mean you necessarily need treatment, okay? So big bulky lymph nodes that we think are infringing or making, compressing on an organ or giving you symptoms, those are the people that we're talking about that we're you know, interested in treating, okay? Just having the presence of lymph nodes alone is not a reason to treat. And what about your spleen? So I told you to think of your spleen like a big lymph node. So if the spleen gets very, very large, it can push up on your diaphragm. It can make you, um, uh, you know, think of it like as if you're being, for those of you who are women and have had children, think of it like being pregnant. You really don't have room for anything else. So you get full quickly when you eat. You can have discomfort on certain positions when you lay down. So splenomegaly, big lymph, big spleen, is another reason um, that we would treat individuals. Okay. So I kind of went through that, didn't I? So years ago, and, and hopefully uh, we'll run clinical trials that I'll actually see whether or not this is different now. Years ago, the, the whole caveat that Dr. Keating had talked about yesterday with watch and wait, we really like you guys. The watch and wait crowd is not a bad thing. I understand it's very frustrating. I, I really do. I often tell my patients who first get diagnosed that it's going to take them a year to grapple with the fact that they have a new diagnosis and, and why are they being watched and monitored rather than being treated and cured. Well, because right now we technically don't have, we can argue about allotransplant transplant and some of the new drugs, but we don't have a curative, you know, for a catch-all for everybody where we can say we have drug X, you have CLL, let's give you drug X, you're cured, you're done. We don't have that. And, believe it or not, there's a quarter of patients with CLL who never, never need to be treated. So despite all these wonderful therapies, if I don't need to give you, if I knew a priori that you're one of those that doesn't need chemo, I don't care about drug X. I don't want to give you chemo. Why do I have to give you any side effects? So if I knew that you were the quarter of the population that never needs treated for your CLL, perhaps we should be studying those cells, then you don't need treatment ever. Go beyond, have fun, go on your merry way. So it's important that I understand the frustration of watch and wait, but if we don't need to expose you to drugs that could give you potential toxicities before you need them, be happy you're in the watch and wait group. And you're giving people like us more time to find new drugs, okay? Um, old studies with the traditional chemoimmunotherapy programs that Dr. Keating and Dr. Halleck and Dr. Johnson, they all talked about, those traditional studies never showed that if we treated people earlier, we made an impact on survival. So just having a diagnosis of CLL and then giving you chlorambucil or FCR or something like that didn't necessarily change people's survival compared to the watch and wait. So that's where that comes from, because those drugs weren't necessarily touted as being curative. 
Okay? Now, in the era of the new drugs, we don't know that. We don't know if it, starting the new kinases or drugs like them earlier, perhaps, perhaps maybe choose patients with poor prognostic markers like 17P or something else, or the unmutated. If we start that group on earlier treatment, will that change their survival ultimately? So these are new questions we're going to have to delve into in the clinical trial arena to figure out whether or not that may actually change survival. But the older drugs didn't. Okay. So uh, criteria, as I said, Cytopenias, anemia, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, okay? And there's not a number. People always go, well, is, you know, if I, my white count is 300, do I have to get treated? No. If your other counts are fine, you don't know that your white count's 300. You don't feel that. So you don't, white count isn't the absolute number of your white count shouldn't be a trigger for chemo. Now, if you're rapidly rising, your doctor may say, your white count's going up quite quickly, so you're, the time to your treatment may be sooner because they can use that as the tempo or a guide. But the absolute white count in and of itself should not be what's triggering treatment. That consult I get a lot. Can't, you know, that's the one consult that I love because actually I save people from chemotherapy. <laughs> My doctor wants to treat me. My white count's high. Everybody's panicked. Don't panic. Okay? So cytopenias, big bulky lymph nodes, splenomegaly, lots of symptoms. Okay, and symptoms usually go into the context with changing blood counts or growing lymph nodes. Just being tired, I work a lot of hours, I'm tired all the time. But just being tired isn't a reason. It has to be in context with the change of your disease. That makes sense. Okay. Now, other reasons that people should be evaluated for. So if something doesn't make sense where we think people are progressing in the normal fashion with regards to their CLL, the doctors need to do a little digging. We need to fish. We need to look around. So if somebody has isolated anemia, I'm gonna work that up. Because really, you know, when people start progressing with their CLL, we also wanna see other changes too. So if your white count's exactly the same, but your hemoglobin's dropping, your platelets are the same and your lymph nodes haven't changed, there might be something else going on. And so it's really important to look for other causes of, let's say, the cytopenia, whether it be anemia or thrombocytopenia. If there's an isolated cytopenia or an isolated change, we want to make sure it's, it, it, there may be something else that could be contributing to that because we might treat that differently. So for people with autoimmune hemolytic anemia or autoimmune thrombocytopenia, for those of you out there, you know what this means. There are blood tests that we can identify if you're hemolyzing, that's the catchphrase, right? You might have heard that, that if you're actually, your barrel's actually making your red cells fine, but they're chewing them up in the circulation, it's related to your CLL, but we may give you different therapies. So it's important important for the doctors to make sense of what's going on with your blood counts to make sure it is your CLL because what we might do might be very different if it wasn't your CLL or if it's um, an autoimmune process versus maybe you're having um, you know, some gastritis. That's a great consult. Anemia, I scope them, they got gastritis or H. pylori, I fix it, they don't need chemo. Nice, huh? So you have to look at other, other reasons that, you might, that may not make sense with your CLL. Now, very, very aggressive disease. So for people, I know that we, we focused a lot about Richter's transformation yesterday. That happens in about 10 or 15% of folks. And we see it more typically, more commonly in patients that have had multiple prior chemotherapies for their disease, really because their disease is just becoming resistant to treatment. Okay? So yes, it can transform. The most common is to a large cell lymphoma. But as Dr. Keating said yesterday, there are some rare transformations. We don't think any of them are good. Okay. Now, there's some people who transform, and I spoke to a few of you, I think, yesterday, who might have had transformation but never had chemo for your CLL. You guys are still curative of your transformation. Your CLL will always come back okay, until we're smart enough to get drugs that don't make it come back. But your CLL might come back eventually. But your large cell lymphoma could be cured. So there's two different very big groups. Most are in the other caveat, very heavily pretreated. But there's a small subset, never treated, can be cured from your large cell lymphoma or your Richter's transformation. Okay. Uh, the workup, you guys, we talked a little bit about this, so blood tests, and, and, and Susan and others eloquently talked about all these prognostic markers. And I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna briefly go through this because I'm gonna tell you about how I feel about some of these things. Now, CAT scans, somebody brought up CAT scans. I think that's a very, very important question. And actually, I'm very mad at, where's, I'm a little mad at pharma uh, for this because on, some of, on, on many of the clinical trials we've participated in, 
um, with the newer kinases, there were a lot of CAT scans. I couldn't stand it, right? I mean, it was annoying. My pati our patients hated it. I hated it. Uh, but they were looking to make sure that, you know, with these new kinases, they were looking at lymph nodes and seeing how quickly they either shrank or grew. Okay. So CAT scans, unless at diagnosis, I actually don't do CAT scans. If somebody's got a complaint, I do a CAT scan. Or if I'm concerned, I do a CAT scan. Prior to therapy, I'll do a CAT scan. But just to, you know, many uh, in the U.S., so I don't know how it works in Canada, <laughs> but in the United States, a lot of oncologists will CAT scan their patients all the time, every six months. I am not going to make a decision about cats, you know, about changing the treatment recommendations on somebody if I see that their lymph node went from one centimeter to two centimeters. That's 100% growth. Somebody might make an argument, go, look, he grew 100%. Not enough reason to treat you. Don't cat scan somebody. So unless there's a reason, somebody's got a complaint or an issue, repeated imaging is not necessary unless it makes sense, okay? And we're going to talk uh, PET scans, I think they briefly talked about. And, and I realized the reason why I switched, because all the, all the fancy data got shown yesterday. So I pulled that out of my, my talk. But I realized, because people ask, what's an SUV? What's a PET scan? So CAT scans show three-dimensional imaging. So they look at organs, right? So they, they slice you up in the machine. Not literally. Um, but they, you know, they look at pictures that cut. And you could look at organs and size of things. And... Uh, you know, it's a picture. A PET scan is actually a glucose avid dye that goes to areas that are metabolically active. So that could be cancers, not all cancers. Um, that could be uh, infection. So somebody with an infection, it's going to go to areas that are metabolically active. And in CLL and lymphoma, your lymph nodes will, the radiologist reads this as degrees of uptake. That's this SUV. So when they look at this in, in lymphoma and CLL, the more mature lymphomas or indolent lymphomas like follicular and CLL, SLL, the cells you know, metabolize slowly. So they read them with very low uptake. But in large cell lymphoma or more aggressive lymphomas, a lymph node will be much hotter. So the SUV is a lot hotter. That's what Dr. Keating was referring to. That's where you use a PET scan. So if you're concerned that somebody's got a lot of symptoms out of proportion to what you think their disease is doing, a PET scan can be useful because you want to know if there's a lymph node that's really, really hot, that's the lymph node you want to biopsy because you're trying to show the other cancer. You're trying to prove that someone else may not just have CLL anymore. So you want to biopsy that lymph node, not a random lymph node. That's useless to me. So you want to biopsy a lymph node because you're trying to show that somebody's transformed because you might change their chemo accordingly. So just bi biopsying a random lymph node doesn't make any sense. So that's where we use PET scans in CLL, where we think that somebody might have more aggressive disease, their biology is changing, they're symptomatic. That's not routine CLL. We want to make sure that you know, it's not transformation or it's not something more ominous, where the treatment recommendations might be different. So having a random biopsy of a lymph node is useless. We want to use a PET scan to see if one is much hotter than the rest, and that's the one we want to go for, if it's feasible. Now let's talk about all these fancy prognostic markers just briefly. See, I told you I'd do CLL 101. So clearly these, these are the prognostic markers that you know, many have talked about and the ones we've focused on um, because these are the ones we know about. Okay? Uh, and so uh, it's, you know, for those of you who get very sophisticated, you make a chart, you get online, and you go, okay, let's go bad, good, intermediate. And you list all these, and you go, hey, what do I have? What do I have? Now, many of our original studies on all these prognostic markers were retrospective. So we would look at these markers and go, well, if you had this, you did this. If you had this, you did this. And then now you put them all together. So the problem is, is that not everybody behaves the same. So we can talk about our folks with 17P, because traditionally, if you look at that classic Donner paper that Dr. Keating and others showed yesterday, that traditionally folks with 17P have a more aggressive disease course, that their time to their first treatment is sooner than everybody else. That's true. But are there people in our practice that have a 17P that we've monitored for years, never treated? Absolutely. So their biology is different. 
Clearly, do we know everything? Obviously we don't. So I think it's important, you know, for those of you who follow this, it's important to know your prognostic markers. We wouldn't believe me. It tells us something too, as we're learning more about treatments and also how to better our treatments. But remember, what's really, really important is the tempo of your disease because everybody could be different. And so I, I, you know, I, I, I hold that out because there are individuals who have you know, 13Q that you know, I've treated you know, within two years, which is atypical, and then I have a gentleman who may have 17P that I haven't treated in seven years. So clearly there's not, we, we are learning about the biology of CLL, and you can have a mix of good and bad features all at once, and we're still trying to put this all together. So it's, in truth, what we were saying with all that fancy data yesterday about where people fall out on the curves, and we're trying to break that data down, particularly with new treatments, and so that's all very important, but each of you are individuals, and so you need to understand and respect, as we respect, that your disease could be different. Ah, I talked about that. You know my bias now on CAT scans. Okay. Um, again, let's talk a little bit also now, now let's talk about relevance of treatment and some of the things that you also heard about yesterday in terms of um, performance status and the Sears score and all that stuff. So intuitively, um, as physicians, um, most of us, you know, when we look at treatment and starting treatment on any of you, we actually do do this mental calculation, albeit you could see that there's a lot of leeway in this calculation. We look at your kidney function, we look at your performance status, we look at some of your other comorbidities. The SEER score could be, it's a little fussy because you can even, you know, if you have something that we might consider minor, like you had cataract surgery, you can get a point of one for that. Do I think a cataract sur surgery is, makes you more worse, you know, makes your uh, comorbidity score really worse receiving chemotherapy? No, probably not. But you can see there's a lot of flexibility and leeway when the doctors calculate these fancy scores. So we're really talking about your organ function and how well you are, okay? And when somebody is good, you know, we can be surprised too. So we use these as guides, okay? But they're guides. So you have to take that into consideration. Now, the, all these fancy prognostic tests that we talked about, as we learn more about the biology of your disease, and as we're getting better therapies, we are trying to tailor therapies based on some of these features as we break down your, um, your prognostic markers, your genetic mutations, and then as we test out these new therapies, we look and see how those different subgroups did. So as you all know, abrutinib, for example, was approved for patients, whether previously treated or not previously treated with a 17P deletion. And why? Because the data was that good. So as we go along with newer agents and we evolve, we, all, we will be looking at this. And it, as we figure out the biology better, hopefully we can. Hopefully we can subgroup and say, well, you have this, this, and this about your disease. This therapy tends to work better for you than this therapy. We're not even gonna bother going to that therapy. So that's what the goal is ultimately, and ultimately, of course, to find a cure for, for, this, for this leukemia for everybody. Okay. You, history, history, history is really, really important uh, for, for many cancers, and Susan did a beautiful job of this, talking about uh, sort of the evolution of chromosomal development and figuring out how to test them and the Philadelphia chromosome and, and CML. And similarly, you know, CL has a, a long tradition, um, and, you know, it really has been a remarkable time. I can't, I can't t specify, um, I've been doing clinical trials in CLL for 12 years. Uh, and I can't tell you from running the first, some of the, the original chemoimmunotherapies with sequential FCR and others and PCR, um, then coming into the era of the monoclonal antibodies and now all these new no novel oral agents. It's, it's incredible. It really is incredible. Um, and we really have made strides in this disease. And it, it's going so quickly that it's hard to keep up because there are studies opening and closing all the time uh, and at very fast pace. So stay tuned. So it's really, really a lot of advances. And what's old is new again. You saw data yesterday on chlorambucil and obinutuzumab. In the U.S., we don't tend to use a lot of chlorambucil. We just don't. But in, the, in Europe, in the UK, you know, we, there was a lot of historic data that there was no necessarily, there was a great survival advantage with chlorambucil versus fludarabine. And so hence, you know, you have an oral cheap agent 
still in the mix. And that's why the FDA always, you know, asks us to randomize, as silly as many of us think, randomize data against chlorambucil to get drugs approved. But there was a lot of good reason for that because, for, you know, chlorambucil has less toxicity and there wasn't necessarily a survival advantage in older patients when compared to fludarabine alone. So this is why some of those older therapies are still being utilized for the treatment of CLL. And clearly when you add an antibody, who knew? Look at the surprising results. We would have never expected that adding chlorambucil to obinutuzumab, you would have a CR frequency that, was, that you guys saw yesterday in 20%. That's a lot. Chlorambucil, less than 5% of patients with chlorambucil alone go into a complete remission. So having such a bump was really quite, quite startling. Okay. So many of you know about the different treatment options, and so I'm not going to talk about them because you heard a, plenty, a, a lot of data about this yesterday. But I think it's important to know that until we have a cure for CLL, individualizing treatment, which we talked about in terms of your SEER score, your comorbidities, you know, what we think you can handle, what are the goals of treatment, what may be some of these prognostic markers factoring in, that we still need to individualize treatment. And I understand that obviously for many of you who are Canadians, clearly getting some of these drugs approved is also a big hurdle. So there's a lot of things that come into play. Um, finances, your ability to get certain drugs, uh, part of this is approval as well. Um, and also part of this is patient choice. So you have to, with your physicians, individualize and talk about therapies, side effects of therapies, and, um, and really make individual choices. Okay, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, in, uh, I had a, a, a patient of mine who needed therapy, and they're young and fit. And we talked about FCR, and we talked about BR, and we talked about the kinases and a clinical trial, because I obviously run clinical trials. And she said, I don't want a pill. Despite this fancy data, I can't take a pill. I can't take a pill indefinitely. I want six months of chemotherapy. I want to be done. I want you to monitor me after that, because there's no way I'm going to be compliant. End of story. That was her choice. So these are individual choices until we find something that's curative. We're, we're want, you remember, the ther we want the therapies to be tolerable to you all, minimize toxicities, because if the therapy is worse than the disease, then we're not doing you any good. And you have to individualize your choices. So talk to your physicians. Okay. You guys saw all this fancy stuff. So obviously a very new error for CLL. Okay. So the kinases that we talked about yesterday and today, blocking certain proteins, really, 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 really exciting stuff. And there's many more. But I want to show you this because I do want to show you the, uh, just to, for those of you who might be on one of these new oral agents, the reason why we think these drugs are so exciting is that traditionally when we talk about chemoimmunotherapy programs for CLL, if you got a cycle of FCR, bendamustine, and rituximab, remember you'd get that once a month. That's what a cycle is. It would take a month or two for people's lymph nodes to soften. You know, you needed subsequent cycles to really make them vanish. But here, in a very short time, in a patient who was refractory, in a month, their lymph nodes are gone. So even in patients who had gotten a lot of chemotherapy, these are why these drugs really have made the excitement of CLL you know, paramount with all these new agents because the, the response rates are very, very quick, very different than most chemoimmunotherapy programs. Okay. This is um, uh, also a patient, um, but uh, instead of abrutinib, this is a patient on idelisib just to give an example of the dramatic change in lymph nodes. So what about clinical trials? Because obviously the, those of us who are here, the physicians who are here, are interested in advancing the care of CLL, right? We're all looking to make it better for you all and to find cures. And so there's a gazillion million trials running right now. Um, and I think, you know, uh, Michael and uh, both Michaels uh, touched upon this a little bit yesterday, but it's really, really important that um, there's a lot of questions we want answered going forward to make it better for you all and to change the sort of traditional approaches that we've done in the past. And so there's a lot of trials looking at combining these agents with antibodies, even chemotherapy. I know that everybody's like, wow, why are we going back to chemo? It's still there because of that data that Michael had shown about FCR and per perhaps 20% of those patients in long term may be, may, be, may be cured. Those are the patients who are mutated with a 13Q, but there might be a subgroup. So are we throwing at chemoimmunotherapy just yet? 
Not just yet. We have to be conservative, I think. We'd like to get rid of it because some of the toxicities, but we still have to respect the data. So I think that you'll see that there's going to be a lot of clinical trials looking at combining. Can we maybe get somebody to have a really good response to chemo, maybe with one of these new agents plus chemo, and then stop therapy? Then they don't have to be on one of these oral agents indefinitely. So there's lots of different strategies. Uh, I'm just going to show you two trials of many. Um, these are intergroup studies. These are not mine. But just to give you an example, in younger folks, one of the trials is randomizing FCR to abrutinib and rituximab. So again, they're trying to see, can a kinase and an antibody improve or be better than the standard of care, if those of you think FCR is standard of care, um, but can it be better than FCR? In the older folks, well, since we now said that data that, that Michael Halleck showed you yesterday about um, uh, bendamustine being more tolerable in patients who are older, so the BR regimen has sort of replaced FCR in our older folks uh, uh, in the United States. Uh, we tend to, a lot of the older folks are getting BR instead of FCR. They're randomizing BR versus abrutinib versus abrutinib and rituximab. They're trying to see, can we replace the older therapies with some of these newer agents? And this is just a very small example of all the clinical trials that are running. Okay, now let's talk about practical stuff, a few slides on practical stuff. So for traditional chemoimmunotherapy, when doctors talk to you about cycles, a cycle of chemotherapy like bendamustine rituximab or FCR or PCR or RCVP or any of these labels that you hear is a treatment once a month, more or less. That's what a cycle is. So for most traditional chemoimmunotherapy programs, you're getting six cycles of treatment. So you're done in six months. That's what they're talking about, okay? What might you need? So even though your treatment's only once a month, what does that mean for you? It's not just once a month. You're getting blood tests more frequently. The doctor needs to monitor you. We want to look to make sure your counts are okay, if you need any transfusions. If you're neutropenic, you might get that injection, Nulasta or Filgrastum, to boost your neutrophil count. So you might be seeing the doctors more often than just the chemotherapy treatment dates, okay? So realize that when you're getting real chemotherapy or chemoimmunotherapy, you're going to be committed for six months, and rightfully so. You want to get through treatment safely. Your doctor needs to monitor you. It's really, really important, okay? Um, the, the, it's always important. People have mentioned the immunity quite, quite a bit, um, and it's always important to note that obviously your CLL puts you more risk for infection, but certainly when you're on one of these chemoimmunotherapy programs, you're more at risk for infection. So if you're something, you get a cold or a fever, you need to call the doctor. If you're being treated and something, you think you're getting signs or symptoms of an infection, they need to address those issues quickly. We don't want you getting admitted in the hospital for pneumonia or some other infection. We want to prevent it. So if we can and we think you need antibiotics, we're going to give them to you. Okay? So it's important to communicate with your doctor. What about other things on treatment? Nausea can happen, of course. Um, for those of us who do a lot of this, we try to prevent nausea before it starts. So we give you lots of, lots of anti-nausea medicines. And part of nausea depends on the drugs. So not all chemotherapy drugs for CLL give you nausea. Same with hair loss. Most chemotherapy programs for CLL, you don't lose your hair. Okay, so you have to talk about these specifically with your treating physician. Cognitive changes, how many people talk about chemo brain? It happens, exactly. It happens, right? And the longer, and the more, even if you're handling chemotherapy, great. Towards the end, you get, your blood counts can be beautiful and your lymph nodes can be gone, but you might feel foggy and tired, even though your hemoglobin can be normal. That's the cumulative nature of chemo. And I tell my folks who are getting traditional chemo immunotherapy programs that it's going to take several months after their last treatment. You know, try like three, four months for them to kind of feel like they're back to themselves again. Okay, so there are changes that occur that while you're on a chemoimmunotherapy program. I think it's important that patients get prophylax for herpes and for pneumocystis. Um, so uh, the, I believe it or not, even with the oral kinases, and this is something we can evaluate, I just had my first case of PCP on a brutinib. So I, I prophylax. The person who got it was somebody who chose not to be prophylaxed. So there are simple things that we can protect you from rare and atypical infections that I think are important. And then the person who asked about dental, no elective procedures on chemoimmunotherapy, unless it's an emergency. So if you are on chemotherapy, you're getting FCR, and you want to go for a cleaning, no. I tell my patients, absolutely not. 
If you have a dental emergency, like an abscess, okay, we're giving you antibiotics and you're going. But no elective procedures when you're on chemoimmunotherapy. Now, the pills are different. So for people on kinases, you're going to be on these agents long term. That's different. If you need a root canal or need aggressive dental work, I prophylax. If the dentist doesn't do it, I do. But just cleanings, no. Okay. And then for those one or two slides left, for those of patients in the watch and wait program, um, I think everybody stressed this enough. The tempo of your disease pe periodic monitoring, your doctor's going to tell you when they want to see you. If they see a change, they might say, come back a month sooner than I normally see you. I just want to see the tempo of what you're doing. Every doctor's different. It's individual, and what you're doing is individual. Recommendation, you guys heard plenty about vaccines and also not having live vaccines. And, you talk, and we talked plenty, Erin talked beautifully, as well as others, about taking care of your body. We can't stress that enough. If you take care of your organs, then depending upon the side effects of some of these agents, you'll better be able to handle them. So take care of what you can. And cancer screening, of course, Erin uh, discussed uh, in great length and beautifully. Stay up to date on your cancer screening. There's no limitations on your activity. If you're, if you're, not, if you're in the watch and wait crowd, do whatever you want. There's no restrictions. I mean, sometimes I, I'll ask my patients in front of their spouse, do you need me to write so you don't have to take out the trash or mow the lawn? Okay, I'll give you a doctor's pass for that. But other than that, really, there aren't limitations. You wanna travel? Travel, okay? Sometimes I'll tell folks if they're going into areas that are their health, where there may not be access to healthcare, sometimes I will offer antibiotics so they have a prescription they can take with them depending upon where they're going. Doesn't replace medical care or seeing a physician, but if I know that they need something, they have it with them. And always report infections to your physician. Some people work with their internists on that. Others, their primary doctor. In my case, I usually have my patients tell me. So in conclusion, that was the basics. CLL is really, 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 really an exciting time. There's a lot of new drugs, so you guys need to stay optimistic. Chemoimmunotherapy, we haven't gotten rid of it because there's still really good results. And that's why it hasn't gone away just yet. But we will see what some of these new clinical trials do and whether or not having one of these newer agents may replace or adjunct or add benefits, if they don't add too much toxicity, to some of these more traditional approaches. And now there's lots of alternatives for your older folks, for the average age of this disease. Many choices now that we didn't have before. So I think that's a very, very good thing. Um, and where traditional therapies are inadequate, like the 17P, I think we're doing much better. You know, clearly that is definitely a game changer for those folks. You, you have a 17P, if you can get on a brutinib or a kinase, I think that versus going on chemoimmunotherapy, if it's available, I still think that's the way to go. What about future, future implications? We have a lot to figure out. Despite all these fantastic new drugs, we have a lot of questions to answer, and we need your support to answer them. You guys, just by being here, are advocates about your disease, advocates hopefully to your local provinces and to your government, advocates for clinical trials. Because we're kind of, I remember I told you about the leukemia is kind of rare compared to breast cancer, colon, and everything else. We're sort of the underdogs when it comes to clinical trials. And it's really, really fast paced. So if you can support us, I think ultimately uh, it's a mutual benefit for all. Uh, relapse questions, what do we do? Patients who fail, one kinase, can they be salvaged with another? What about other oral agents? Dr. Halleck talked about ABT. What about chimeric antigen receptors? There's a lot of new things that are coming to play for patients because you can see that the kinases aren't necessarily curative for everybody, or we don't know if they're curative for anybody. So we still need to do our part to find new and safer and better therapies for you folks with CLL. And then, of course, we uh, briefly talked about the pharmacoeconomics of continuous therapy. What do we do? With that, I want to thank you all. Participate in clinical trials. That was a fantastic, fantastic talk. Um, One, there's another. Ah. Uh, traditionally with CLL, uh, the ALC level goes up uh, and you start monitoring Dublin time over 15. Uh, with marrow penetration increasing all the time, how often do you see a subset of those patients with somewhat normal ALC, say 15, 20, 30, 
uh, regular normal levels of hemoglobin, yet uh, constantly decreasing platelet counts. Yeah, so I mean that's a really so if I have your question, I'm going to repeat it so everybody can hear it. How often do you see can if the normal levels of lymphocyte and normal hemoglobin can you see a decline in platelet count? How often does that occur? Well, the, the one of the things we'd want to make sure in that individual is whether or not they have autoimmune thrombocytopenia. Excluding that. You got to look for why. So if the platelet count is declining and everything else is staying the same, there's something else going on. So if they don't really have ITP or autoimmune thrombocytopenia, we need to figure out why they're declining their platelet count. Is it a medication? So medications can make your blood counts decline. Is there something else going on concurrently with that patient that may happen, a blood clot or something else? You have to look for other causes. That's different. So if you do the marrow and they're packed and they really, you're proving that they don't have any other reason and they have this isolated cytopenia, but it really is due to the CLL, then you're going to make a trigger on whether or not that patient needs to be treated based on their CLL because of that isolated. So if you've ruled out other causes, you do the marrow and they're packed, but their platelet count is really, really low, meaning if you, in, depending upon what the physician and the patient are comfortable with, whether that's under 100,000, whether that's under 50,000, you might need treatment just based on that if they've ruled out other causes. It's not as common. It's, it's not so common, but have I seen it? Yeah, unfortunately I have. But it's not, it's not the run of the mill. Yes. Uh, can you espouse on the relationship that you have with the scientists in a drug company that develop these drugs, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for those of us who do clinical research or even laboratory research, um, you know, our relationships are as, you know, we have to, unfortunately, years ago when I started um, uh, running clinical trials in CLL, uh, most of the trials, actually 50% of my studies were investigator-initiated studies. In other words, those are studies that I designed and wrote myself and then sought either government funding or, or private funding or philanthropy or pharma funding to support them. And the other 50% were pharmaceutical-based studies, meaning that a company comes to you and says, we have this trial. Are you interested in participating? Nowadays, it's, a bit, it's actually been a lot more challenging um, because uh, the money for um, investigator-initiated studies is more difficult to get. Um, and to be frank, the pharmaceutical industry, the world of oncology drugs is turning over so quickly and new agents are coming about so, f you know, with a rate that's unheard of um, that uh, oftentimes the companies are coming to you. Um, and so we do work with um, not only both the trials that the pharmaceutical companies are offering because they have a particular agent that we might be interested in, but then you get to know the people. So there's a lot of um, patient, there are a lot of physicians who have left academia who go work for these companies and you develop relationships and they're constantly, you know, asking those of us who are in whatever cancer that we're doing, um, you know, have you seen this? What do you think of this? Um, so there is a little, there is a back and forth that does go on. It's not purely a one-sided um, uh, investment. And so there is, you have to work, unfortunately we still have to work with them because there's just a plethora of agents that we can't, we can't develop on our own that quickly. Um, and they can. So there is back and forth between scientists um, laboratory investigators, clinical investigators, and people from pharma. Happens quite frequently.